Good afternoon. Um, my name is Anthony Bubalo. I'm the director of the West Asia program here at the Lowy Institute for International Policy. I'd like to welcome you all today to today's Wednesday Lowy Lunch. It almost seems a bit belated to be talking about the new media uh, in the Middle East some decade or so after um, this phenomenon began, uh, began to unfold in the region. All of us have heard about Al Jazeera and many of us under, certainly understand the dramatic impact that the internet has had on information flows globally uh, and, and even in comparatively information constrained parts of the world like the Middle East. But for me it's a particularly apt time to be looking at this topic especially because in recent years and in the last year in particular we've seen in many countries in the Middle East a stepped up campaign against um, what we call the new media, the internet and satellite TV. It's not just the Al Jazeera bureaus in the region that have been closed, and that's a pattern that's, that's gone on for, for a decade or so. But in the last year, in particular, we've seen uh, bloggers arrested uh, everywhere from Egypt to Saudi Arabia. And yet, this also poses a very interesting question for the regimes that are struggling to stuff the information genie back into the bottle. Uh, they face a real quandary in many ways. For in trying to control the internet and, and the new media and the technologies associated with it, they're also potentially undermining uh, and undercutting their ability, the, the ability of their own countries to buy into the economic success story, well, until recently at least, um, that was globalisation. At today's Wednesday Lowry Lunch, we're very fortunate, uh, therefore, to have with us someone who can tackle this question from a number of different uh, angles and perspectives. David Hardacre is a veteran journalist, having worked, I hope you don't mind me calling you a veteran, no, David. thanks, Anthony. Um, having worked on a number of Australia's leading radio and TV and current affairs programs, including on, on radio, on AM, The World Today, and PM, and on TV, Four Corners, Foreign Correspondent, and The 7.30 Report. He was, until fairly recently, uh, the ABC's former Middle East correspondent. He is a twice winner of Australian journalism's highest award, the Walkley Award, uh, including uh, for his coverage of the 2006 Israeli Hezbollah war. David has lived and worked in a number of Middle Eastern countries, including in Egypt, uh, where he took the interesting decision, and for someone like me who uh, took the same decision many, many years ago, a somewhat masochistic decision to learn <laughs> Arabic. <laughs> um, he's also, more importantly, um, writing a paper for the Lowy Institute, the Lowy Institute analysis on the very topic that he'll be speaking on um, today. Please join me in welcoming David Hardacre. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Anthony, uh, the masochistic decision, yes, to learn Arabic. I'll, I'll be coming to that. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with you to speak about the two loves of my life. That's the media, uh, my, my wife, of course, but my professional life, the media and the Arab world. I'll be looking at detail, in detail at what happens when these two loves collide or bicker shortly, but uh, first let me fill out a little bit more detail that Anthony alluded to with some personal reflections on my relationship with the Arab world. Uh, as Anthony mentioned uh, just there, I was for a period the ABC's Middle East correspondent, uh, but before I took up my posting <clears throat> I did something which was a little unusual and indeed uh, turned out to be masochistic. Along with uh, my wife and our little son, we set off for Egypt, a wonderful country it is, sir, where we stayed first in Alexandria and then in Cairo for about a year and a half. My mission as such was to learn to read, write and speak Arabic. Why? Well, uh, I could use the streak as a defence, but uh, one, the reason was that the sheer challenge of it. Arabic is considered to be one of the hardest three languages in the world and uh, I'm here to tell you that that is the case. It certainly does deserve its ranking. I remember when I first looked at an, Ara looked at an Arabic newspaper I marvelled at how wonderfully exotic it was. It was a, an amazing collection of, of exclamation marks, of Morse code, uh, something that looked a little bit like Pittman shorthand and it was all seemed then to be thrown together in a blender. The, uh, it, it took a little while, over two to three months, but bit by bit it did start to fall in place for me. I took the tough road to learning the language. I uh, Sometimes for five and six hour stretches I would 
plough through uh, Egypt's official daily newspaper, Al Ahram, or the pyramids. And uh, as anybody who's ever learnt a language will tell you, repetition is the key to remembering. So what, wo what words did I learn from Egypt's state-run newspaper? Kimma comes to mind, that means summit, as in Egypt's President Hosni Mubarak will be flying to Riyadh for a summit meeting of Arab leaders. In the same vein, Rais, or President, comes to mind, as in President Hosni Mubarak will be flying to Amman for a summit with Arab leaders. Waft is another one. It means delegation, as in the President and his delegation travelled to Doha for a summit of Arab leaders. I also learnt very well the phrases for time, as in the President met with the Algerian delegation for three hours. Or maybe I'm labouring the point, but uh, perhaps you get the drift. The official news in a country like Egypt is first and foremost about the President, where he flew, who he met, who he spoke to on the telephone even, and certainly how he won the election with a massive majority. And on and on it goes. Well, as my language developed, I took to watching the nightly news. Again, it was the same story. Sometimes it, up to the first 10, 15 minutes was about the doings of the president. Then, ladies and gentlemen, one day uh, there was a true revelation for me. When we moved to Cairo, we moved into an apartment with satellite television. And suddenly, a whole new Arab world was open to me. I was, if you like, a, like a child at Christmas time. There were choices everywhere. Which channel out of something like 500 would I choose from? They were all there, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Abu Dhabi. For me, it was a feast. Well, naturally, I settled on Al Jazeera, uh, if for no other reason that I would be able to later boast that I could understand the channel that most Arabs listen to. As, as, as I said, it was a revelation, and uh, here's why. First of all, the president, President Mubarak, usually didn't appear at all on Al Jazeera. On the contrary, and uh, there was uh, very, very little at all about the man who's all over Egypt's official news. And uh, second, when the president did appear, it wasn't necessarily good news about him at all. On the contrary, there were commentators who said some quite nasty things about President Hosni Mubarak. So I didn't realise it at the time, but what I was going through is exactly what the Arab world has lived through. And it's exactly what I'm here to talk about today. The Arab world is run, in the main, by authoritarian governments of various kinds, whether they be one-party democracies or kingdoms like Saudi Arabia or sheikhdoms or emirates. And usually these governments are supported by a pretty tough security apparatus, as you would know. Traditionally, these governments have held a very tight rein on, on information, either through state-run newspapers, state-run radio, or state-run television. Now, these have given massive space to the goings-on of the, of the rulers and of the officials, but little or no space at all to the dissident elements in these societies. And whether these be human rights campaigners, democracy advocates, or, just as importantly, religious extremists. So the issue we're asked to consider here is what happens to a society when suddenly the walls come crashing down? When a government's iron grip on information is broken? When the citizens discover that uh, heavens above, or they at least have it confirmed by outside sources, that their leaders have feet of clay? Well, here's one thing I can tell you, it's not easy. Certainly, it's not easy for the regime. Nor, I think it's fair to say, is it easy, is it easy for some in society, particularly for an older generation which has grown up with, if you like, misinformation. So the new media, which as Anthony explains is uh, satellite television and the internet, has become the new invader. The new media doesn't recognise state borders. In the Arab world, this means the new media has shaken the old order and not everybody likes it. Now, as an aside, I remember one moment when I was uh, the Middle East correspondent uh, uh, based in Jerusalem. The, uh, 
I was doing a story about the 40-year uh, 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 anniversary of the Six-Day War, and I was interviewing a Palestinian woman about her recollections of, of the Six-Day War, and she related how she and her family had been huddled in their home, and they were listening to the official Salt al Arab uh, radio station, the Voice of Arabs, and it was reporting great Arab victories in the battlefield. And at that very moment, at that very moment, she looked out across the way to the schoolyard and she saw a group of Israeli soldiers planting their flag in the ground. Now, 40 years later, I could tell that that was an extreme shock for her, this collision of what of reality with what has been crafted, a, a, a carefully constructed lie, which carries the authority of the state. So the collision of the myth and the reality is very tough to handle. And such a scenario, you could say, can't happen today because the new media of satellite television and the internet have now made it impossible for governments to fool all of the people all of the time. Wars are happening in real time. I remember covering the Israeli, uh, Israeli Hezbollah war. It's, uh, you, both, both sides can see minute by minute what they're doing, what each other's doing. So it's not that the governments wouldn't like to control it and not that they don't keep trying to control it, but it is difficult. In a sense, it all started, as Anthony alluded to, with Al Jazeera, the satellite station which uh, the ruler of Qatar started in 1996. Now, we all know how much the Bush administration detests Al Jazeera, but they're not the only ones. The same applies, or has applied, to a number of Arab regimes, in particular Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Why? Well, in the case of Egypt, I think it's fair to say that Al Jazeera has given voice to those who don't necessarily agree with the deal between the, which Egypt has struck with the United States as a, a major ally in the Middle East. Uh, Al Jazeera has also dared to cover and uncover some pretty nasty truths about what happens in Egypt, uh, involving the, particularly the security apparatus and uh, instances of corruption and brutality. In Saudi Arabia's case, the Assad family has been insulted by broadcasts on Al Jazeera to the extent that, on one occasion, Riyadh withdrew its ambassador to, uh, to Doha. The Saudis have also been incensed by Al Jazeera's willingness to broadcast whatever, well, some of whatever Osama bin Laden might say. And, of course, uh, bin Laden would be like to overthrow the Saudi regime. So, not surprising, surprisingly, they're a little sensitive to that. But beyond the particular cases, <clears throat> it's hard to escape the conclusion that these two traditional powers of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, are irked by what looks like a, a grab for influence and power from Qatar. Uh, satellite television has enabled Al Jazeera and with it the, the state to become a pan-Arab power and, uh, and certainly give it pan-Arab influence to the point where really it's hard to, hard to imagine that Qatar could have the standing it does in the region without the existence of Al Jazeera. At the same time, Al Jazeera has grown though out of a traditional Arab media environment which says that really whoever owns the media can say what they wish, in a sense, and they can certainly use it for their own ends, much like state-controlled television, in fact. So while Al Jazeera has been poking the great Middle East powers of Saudi Arabia and Egypt in the eye, its, uh, its journalists have never really been let loose on their own backyard uh, to report on some of the ugly things that happen inside Qatar and its, own, and its close neighbours. However, for all that, for its limitations, it has to be said that the Al Jazeera phenomenon has truly transformed the media landscape in the Arab world. It's given viewers real news instead of the fawning protocol news about whatever the ruler is up to. And in times of the really big news events like Iraq and Afghanistan, the Second Intifada, for example, it's acted as a galvanising force across the Arab world. It's also lifted standards in state-run uh, media and it has forced state-run television and its journalists into places they didn't once want to go to, uh, places which were once taboo. As well, Al Jazeera has been unpredictable. It's permitted live phone-ins from the audience and by doing so, it's encouraged a kind of grassroots 
participation, which is, is certainly not part of the traditional Arab media scene. And so that, of its own, has been a blow against the idea that only, only the elites, only the rulers, only those in power should have a voice on the media. But satellite television isn't uh, just Al Jazeera. It's had many, many imitators, and not the least of which has uh, come from Saudi Arabia itself. El Arabiya was set up in uh, 2002 uh, to reassert Saudi's, uh, Saudi Arabia's power as the heavyweight of the Middle East and to perhaps give a, to give a Saudi perspective on the news. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's also fair to say that satellite television isn't just about the news. It's, it, it doesn't only bother Arab societies because of the way it covers the news. Because it's relatively unfettered, uh, satellite television is also permitting what the more traditional regard as a threat to the Arab Muslim way of life. And on that topic, you, you might have noticed that in the, just the last few weeks, we've seen a stunning reaction uh, to that in uh, Saudi Arabia, where the country's leading religious judicial figure sanctioned the killing of a satellite network of satellite network operators because they were broadcasting material which he judged to be debauched and depraved. So in sum, satellite television in the Arab world has destabilised the political and social order. It hasn't threatened, I don't think, to bring the old order down, but in its relatively short existence, it has had an impact. And it's worth bearing in mind that satellite television was relatively unknown in the Arab world until you know, 15 years ago. And from zero, satellite television has mushroomed to a point where the region's 300 million people can choose from something like 500 channels. No, although not that it's much different to in the West, you know, 64 channels and nothing to watch. It has created new tensions in these societies, uh, these societies which are conservative, family-based and in the main highly conservative. The Arab governments have responded to this threat and they've responded in a number of ways, ranging from the brutal to the more subtle, and I'll get to that later. But as one veteran Egyptian journalist said to me, Arab governments don't change because of Al Jazeera. Now if there is going to be any real change, I think the source of that is much more likely to be the other newcomer in the new media scene, and that's the internet, and in particular blogging and uh, communal sites like Facebook. Already in just four or five years, the bloggers and the Facebookers have had a very high impact on Arab politics. There's a few key differences between the internet and television. Uh, for one thing, vastly fewer people in the Arab world have access to the internet uh, than they do uh, to uh, satellite television. And against that though, the internet is an interactive medium, so it actually invites participation from people, whereas television, as in the West, is, is a passive medium. And, uh, as provocative as Al Jazeera can be at times, in the end people are coming home from a hard day's work and kind of want to just be entertained and take it easy. So the, uh, it, it means that while the spread of the internet is limited in the Arab world, uh, its impact has been, relatively speaking, enormous. Principally because it has enabled direct participation in the political life of Arab countries. But the, key, the big question, of course, is you can have power, but what will, this, uh, what will this newcomer do with it? Well, when people in the West talk about the internet and the Arab world, it's nearly always in the framework of democracy. You know, is, is, is the internet going to bring democracy? I've heard predictions from a number of people that the internet is going to unleash the potential of the individual, which is how we frame it in the West. It, you know, it enables you to express yourself against the, uh, the establishment um, and that by unleashing the potential of the individual it will thereby bring democracy to the Arab world. Well that may or probably will not be the case in the long term but it's true to say that the internet has forced at least a level of accountability 
which I think it's fair to say hasn't before been seen in the Arab world. It has also permitted a level of citizen participation in the political life of the countries and it's given new life to uh, moribund political systems. But when you look at the impact, it's Egypt, which is at the very forefront. Now, the, <coughs> the percentage of people who have access to the internet in Egypt is relatively low compared to the other countries of the Arab world. It's only about 10%. But uh, Egypt has a very large population, something like 80 million, and that means that there are something like 8 million people who have internet access in one way or another, although much less with broadband. Now, to put that 8 million into context, it's actually double the number of the entire population of Lebanon, I think that's right, or maybe Lebanon's 5 million, so, but close to double the entire population of Lebanon. Another characteristic of Egypt, I think, uh, having lived there, I would say it's a, it has a spirit of political expression and activism, though that has been suppressed because of uh, emergency rule for so many years in that country. And on top of all that, Egypt has a very large number of educated young people who are uh, unemployed or, or indeed underemployed. So it's almost as though the internet was invented for Egypt. And certainly it's the case that it has come as a boon for young activists who've been, uh, who have, uh, it seems, finally been given an outlet for their, uh, for their frustrations and for their thoughts. So what have they done with this potential? I'm going to, I'll go to two cases which illustrate the power which the internet has unleashed. In January 2006, from memory, uh, an Egyptian bus driver by the name of Imad al-Kabir was uh, tortured while being held in detention uh, at an Egyptian police station. The police <coughs> kicked him and used a broom handle to, uh, to sodomise him. It's probably not the first time it's happened, it's, but we know in undeniable detail that it did happen this time because of the efforts of a young Egyptian blogger called Wael Abbas. So this is how the story moved from the secrecy of the police station to the wider world. One of the police involved in the, uh, in the, in the assault of the young man was capturing all this on video, on, on his mobile phone, uh, on video. As a deterrent, he sent the video to a relative of the young bus driver. That relative attempted to take it to the traditional media, but they turned it down. And in the end, he came to blogger Wael Abbas, who runs a human rights blog. Abbas took the pictures and he posted them on YouTube. And he started blogging about it. Subsequently, it was picked up by a newspaper, which sought out the young, uh, the young bus driver and convinced him to tell his story publicly. From there, the story was picked up by the television, by satellite television, and action was forced on behalf of the government. The result was that one policeman ended up being convicted and thrown into prison for uh, two or three years, I don't, I'm not quite sure. But it was a small step, but it was highly symbolic. And, uh, had it not been for this, there would have been uh, no accountability whatsoever. So the truth is that without the internet and the courage of a blogger called Wael Abbas, this story would never have seen the light of day. The new media and the new technologies actually enabled something to be brought to the public view and for action to be taken. And the other truth is, though, that having, uh, having uh, praised the power of the new media, uh, the, uh, uh, without the mass media, or even the more traditional media, what appeared on the internet might not have had sufficient reach to force any official action. So the, the Imad al-Kabir story also shows us another very important value uh, of the blogger. Uh, they call themselves citizen journalists. The blogger is prepared to publish what the traditional media won't. And they won't publish because of uh, fear or simply because there is a, an editor who might be friendly with the government. Now, in, com in compiling this paper, uh, that uh, I'm most of the way through, I spoke to uh, Wael Abbas and some other blogger activists who told me how common a practice this is, that 
traditional journalists will essentially allow the bloggers to take the heat, to be the, the cannon fodder uh, you know, from, from security. They will be the ones that will, will um, um, <clears throat> essentially you know, uh, have, to, have to lead from the front and take the consequences of that. But then the, once a story is out on a blog, then they will feel that uh, the traditional journalist will feel that he can, that he can uh, legitimately take it up and uh, bring it into the mainstream media. So that's a, a fascinating interaction between the old and the new media, which is giving power to both, really. So this practice extends even to, uh, to traditional journalists giving a blogger a story which they know they can't run, and then they will follow it up once the blogger has made it public. And I, I know, just to, as an aside, just to depart here, that uh, you know, the role of the blogger, I think, in, in our societies is occasionally that of the crank, uh, not, not wishing to be uh, disrespectful, because uh, very good journalists operate in, uh, in, in our traditional media, if you like. But I think that that's not necessarily the case in the Arab world, and I think that really some of the best journalism is being done by smart young citizens with confidence and courage. And they haven't necessarily gone to a journalism school. They just know that what they're seeing isn't right and they want to do something about it and they're not intimidated. So uh, I personally find them quite inspiring individuals because they certainly don't have the protections that we traditional journalists in Australia or England or wherever have. We're, we're expected to poke the government in the eye but in under an authoritarian regime, it's a very, very brave act. The second case to talk about is the extraordinary power which uh, Facebook, a communal site like Facebook, has given to activists. Uh, a celebrated instance last year uh, in Egypt, a, a young Cairo woman, who's since become known, in fact, as the Facebook girl, called for protest action on her Facebook site, and within a few days, she had something like 70,000 people registered on the site and indeed those people moved to mass protest. 70,000 people. And it's not, the, not only the biggest ever protest action organised in Egypt but uh, it all happened in utter secrecy and away from the eyes of, uh, of the state. <clears throat> Are these two instances of a policeman being jailed and a mass protest being organised might be unremarkable by our standards, by the Western standards, but in an authoritarian state it is really an achievement uh, to bring a degree of accountability and to see political participation for the first time on such a large scale. So where does all this lead? Well, if we look at the reactions of some of the Arab governments, it might, it might not lead very far at all. But in Syria, for example, uh, there is a strong censorship of the internet. A number of popular sites, such as Facebook, uh, are banned altogether. Uh, Saudi Arabia, there is a, a whole section of government devoted to filtering internet sites, uh, to uh, 
the aim of the filtering is to to stop any, the uh, 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 the moral or you know, any threat to the moral, religious, or uh, the political order. A country like Egypt is also call what uh, we might also use what we might call some more traditional methods uh, of controlling dissent. Its security forces have arrested and uh, and tortured bloggers, and most memorably, in the in the case of a young man called Ahmed Mar, the security forces took him from the street and detained him un under threat, so that they would reveal uh, so that he would reveal to them the password to his Facebook account. In the realm of satellite television, a number of Arab governments, uh, as Anthony said in this introduction, have uh, arrested... Uh,